This is kind of the uh, research methodology that Yakir and I and group have used our whole career. It's called Gedanken experiment methodology. It's, you know, famous history, the gold standard of theoretical physics, you know, what Einstein used, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but we have this feeling that it's kind of maybe not as popular these days in, uh, in theoretical physics. So uh, <clears throat> I give it a little, uh, what's the word? Uh, I give it a, a, a plug to come back. But we've been using the same methodology for a variety of different deep questions, not just theoretical physics, but what uh, uh, the second reader in my PhD, Abner Shimoni, called experimental metaphysics, and also what we would call the inner laboratory. So examples of profound mysteries where there's a, a deep tension between modern physics and the inner laboratory, one is the <clears throat> subjective experience of a flow of time, or of a now. Physics says that can't be there. It, it is inconsistent with relativity. Another deep question is experience of free will. And <clears throat> finally, there's a, a last uh, example of uh, a tension between our inner experience and modern physics, which is the experience of a definite reality. And <clears throat> we use a procedure that we call paradoxes, we try to, it's the same kind of procedure that Einstein used, and um, it's a, a way of accentuating the problem, or, or, or of accentuating the conflict between the theories. And it, if, if anything else, I mean, it's, it turns out to be a very successful uh, methodology, but it actually makes it a lot more fun. Okay, uh, lastly, one little plug. Uh, one of my career-long goals was to try to create a sort of a, a brain institute of, of neuroscientists, but of people who could actually communicate with us foundations of physics uh, type people. And <clears throat> I'm happy to say this recently happened. It's called the Institute for Interdisciplinary Brain and Behavioral Sciences at Chapman. And uh, it's headed by Emmy Raz, Aaron Sugar, Uri Moaz, et cetera. And I especially want to thank Fetzer and Templeton for helping to make that happen. It was a non-trivial uh, undertaking. And I just want to make a little, one quick quote from <clears throat> some of the research that's already coming out of it. And this in particular is uh, Aaron Sugar and his collaborators. But <clears throat> this is a very recent, I think within the last month or so, beautiful paper. They argue that consciousness must be explained on a more abstract level than that of neural wiring. To remain within the realm of science, consciousness must be described in terms of what it does and not how it does it. So <clears throat> I'll try to come back to that a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some, some things that are completely new. Um, and just one caveat in terms of how we do theoretical physics. So a lot of our discoveries are concerning reformulations of the standard way of thinking about things. So <clears throat> this means that at some level the predictions are new and you would only say that the predictions are different if, if at some point we, for example, if we discovered that standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics was wrong and needed to be replaced at some point in the future. On the other hand, all these different reformulations teach us something really completely new. I mean, it's only a useful uh, reformulation if it shows you something new, something that you never would have discovered from the old theory, from the old perspective. So what I'm going to try to reach, talk about today is some new aspects of uh, non-localities. Of course, this is something that happens only at the microsco microscopic scale. Something completely new, uh, George's favorite topics have been the whole issue of top-down causality, so we have a bunch of new results on that. Thirdly, we've been playing a lot with the sort of the deep axioms of the theory of quantum mechanics, et cetera. <clears throat> and by reordering them, by getting a new perspective on these axioms, I think it gives you, well, a whole new framework on many aspects of, of both science and the deep questions that you're asking at this conference. So I'll tell you some new things about that, and I probably won't have time to get to the last topic, which has to do about how do we talk about the subjective experience of becoming. So first, uh, a little bit about some new non-localities. I think you're all familiar with Thomas Kuhn. Uh, uh, he wrote things like the structure of scientific revolutions and so on and so forth. But one of the things he kind of emphasized was that a scientific theory has its way of, of uh, protecting itself from falsification, right? It kind of, uh, 
there are, there are usually some uh, hidden assumptions in a scientific theory, and, and it takes a little bit of work to undercover those assumptions. So <clears throat> one of the areas that we've had a lot of success in challenging assumptions has to do with the measurement paradigm. The basic paradigm, how do you do a measurement in the microscopic realm? So the usual way of doing it is um, with the sledgehammer, which is called the von Neumann ideal measurement. So this type of measurement, the, uh, historically, uh, the founders of the theory said that's the best way of verifying the different elements of your theory. But we've invented some new types of measurements, one called weak measurement, and this has to do with kind of more of an ontological question, Schrodinger picture versus Heisenberg picture. But I'll talk a little bit about what the uh, weak measurement told, told us is something about temporal non-locality. If you start asking the ontological question like Schrodinger taught us that well, we should think that there's a Schrodinger wave, or Heisenberg taught us, no, it's something much more abstract. In studying this question, we discovered another kind of dynamical non-locality called dynamical, which is in the equation of motion, and that's something completely new. And to kind of uh, emphasize what's new about these things, I'm going to talk about some things I called quantum miracles. Uh, hopefully I'll get, well, I'll certainly get to this, the subject of top-down causality, now that's uh, traditionally been uh, a big no-no in science, right? I mean, rightly so. Science was, had very good reason to develop as a reductionistic theory. Uh, the, the theorems behind it, things like the exclusion principle, so on and so forth, seemed insurmountable. Um, no way to get around it. So I've been thinking about this. Yakira's been thinking about this most of our lives. And it turns out there's uh, a new way of completely getting around those very seemingly intractable um, aspects of reductionism. And the idea is that this is what science tells us about, that we have the, all the local microscopic interactions, and then that's where all the you know, causal powers are, that's where the teeth are, so to speak. And then that affects some higher level of complexity. And these are supposed to be a no-no, right? You're not supposed to be able to have arrows of causation that go from the whole down to the part. It turns out there is one way of doing this, and um, that turns out to be a result of uh, some of these new ways of thinking about time. So hopefully I'll get into that a little bit. The deep aspect of the axioms of, of quantum mechanics is that the capriciousness or the randomness of the theory was the deep thing, right? And then we saw all these other aspects like non-locality and, and uh, causality, different uh, uh, aspects of the theory, um, which seem to be derivative from the deeper thing called the capriciousness, or, the, or the, what Einstein ca called, uh, you know, God, why does God play dice? And so it turns out that there's a lot of, um, that was kind of an assumption, right? It's an assumption that that should be the prioritization of those axioms. And uh, when we start tinkering with them, uh, basically the, the idea of, is it possible to reformulate the basic axioms of, of quantum mechanics to say that the deeper axioms should be something like non-locality and causality? This is the way that science usually talks about the derivation of the axioms, that at the deepest level we have this kind of uncertainty, the capriciousness, the playing of dice, as Einstein said. And then we have these things like non-locality. Usually we think of that in terms of EPR kind of connections, causality, so on and so forth. And as Abner would always say, they peacefully coexist, right? These are sort of emergent from the deeper thing. And the, what we were able to do is flip this on its head, and we were able to derive the uncertainty of the playing of dice from uh, taking uh, non-locality and caus causality as deeper. Uh, and then there's the issue of, of becoming time. And um, in order to even begin to talk about this, we had to solve some deeper aspects of theoretical physics. And one of those was emphasized by David Gross, uh, who's, you know, like David Hilbert, who specified some of the deep problems of mathematics. David Gross said, here are some of the deep problems of theoretical physics that people should address at some point in the future. And one of those had to do with the sort of artificial separation between the kinematic and the dynamical descriptions of, of theoretical physics. And so we were able to address this and I think solve it in a new kind of picture of sort of underlying the whole, uh, the whole show that we call Each Moment of Time is a New Universe. And um, by comparison, uh, David Albert would always describe this as block universe on steroids. Uh, so it, this in itself doesn't give you a becoming kind of time, 
It, it solves things like we can describe the, uh, the, uh, the state description in quantum mechanics as Lorentz covariant at the level of the state description, not just at the level of, of probabilities. It gives us a lot of nice features, but also it gives us something uh, a completely new, well, it gives us a completely new way of understanding the, uh, the kinematics and the dynamics. And uh, the simulations were working, you would see that there's a way of describing a new kind of time uh, that we call becoming time. So hopefully I'll get a chance to get to that. Okay, so first of all, just talking about some new non-localities. Uh, so we all have been taught that, at least in classical physics, yeah, the equations of motion are all local, right? If you want to understand a force, you look here and there's a, a gradient, a local gradient of the potential there, and that describes the, the, the force at that location. And furthermore, when quantum mechanics came along, you know, the great Paul Dirac told us that eh, there's not really any big difference between the, the equations of classical physics and the equations of quantum mechanics. Um, and so that changed, the original change came with uh, uh, a Harun of Bohm effects. And if the simulation were working, you would see that this just shows the Aron of Bohm effect. Basically, what you have here is a, a completely shielded region. These little white circles are completely shielded region. And this is a wave function for a single particle. And it would, you would see that even though the particle can't know what's going on inside there, nevertheless, over here, you see a completely different interference pattern. So basically, the way Yakir likes to think about it is somehow there's some kind of interaction between something that's going on inside here, right? and the particle that's outside and shouldn't be able to interact with it. And uh, this also shows up in the double slit. What we're able to discover is a new kind of non-locality in the actual equations of motion itself. So that's com something completely new. And this is just part of standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics. It's just hidden there. Um, if we want to understand the puzzle of how is it if a particle goes to this slit, it knows if this other slit is open or closed, it's some arbitrarily far away distance. It turns out the actual equation of motion are, are uh, <laughs> manifestly non-local. There's a non-local interaction in the equation of motion between the particle of this slit and the uh, opening or closing of the slit far away. Finally, um, the other kind of non-locality I want to talk about is not so much non-locality in the equations of motion, but non-locality in, in time, actually. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we have is this basic uh, puzzle that if you look at two atoms, say this is the orbital of an electron around a, a nucleus, um, if they're completely identical in the beginning, they could behave completely differently later on. For example, this atom could decay after one minute, and another identical atom would decay after an hour or something. And you would say that there's absolutely nothing different between them in the beginning, but they behave completely differently later on. And so, this turns out to be one of the fundamental differences between classical and quantum mechanics. Classical physics, we say if we know everything about the system, its position and momentum initially, we know all about the interactions, and we, then we can predict with certainty what the final position and momentum will be. Quantum mechanics, this is not the case. If we know everything that can be known in principle about the quantum mechanical system, and we know all the interactions that we can know in principle, you can have many different possible outcomes. And so, famously, this was originally thought that there was an intrinsic error of time at the microscopic level because of this kind of situation. And famously in 1964, uh, Yakir Aharonov, Peter Bergman, and Joel Lebowitz showed that no, that was just a, an example of a hidden assumption. It was a, a human bias that was snuck into the theory because we, of course, experience time in a certain way, right? The past has happened. So he was able to show that, no, it's not necessary that there's this inherent time asymmetry. And that's become known as the ABL formula. Okay. And basically, it led to a kind of a theory in which we could, the most complete description at any one time was something given by what we call a past and the future, pre-selection and a post-selection. And this is uh, uh, something from one of Max's past uh, FQX talks. I'm telling you that the future is relevant to the present, and you should, should of course, be skeptical. But there's some, a bunch of new things that uh, uh, I'll briefly discuss um, as to why we think that could be relevant. Um, so here's your basic measurement, ideal measurement, binomial ideal measurement. Here we have the interaction between a meter and the system, and we call this a strong measurement. 
And the actual probabilities are given by something called the Aharon of bergman levowitz formula. If you want to do what we call weak measurement, it's basically the same thing if you just, you just turn down the volume, right? You just have a, a lower in, uh, interaction strength between the magnet and the particle. Um, now, as it turns out, this new kind of paradigm, it, it starts with the original picture in science, which you prepare the system in some prepared state, we call that a pre-selection. You do a weak interaction, and then you do something later in time. And you want to see, you want to correlate what happened later in time with the structure of the system at this earlier time, um, sandwiched in between the, what we call the pre-selection and the post-selection. And it turns out the kind of reality that shows up this time is, is uh, and now for something completely different. Mm -hmm. And this is a, what we call the weak value of the observables. Um, so in my PhD, I tried to emphasize that this is really something completely different, and so I predicted all these things I called quantum miracles. Uh, basically, these are phenomena that you, you just simply would never have discovered from the usual standard way of thinking about quantum mechanics. And all these things have been verified experimentally. This, is a, this was a, the quantum Cheshire cat has become very popular. But basically, I said, you know, there's no way of taking a particle and separating for the particle all of its properties, right? Turns out you can do such a thing with pre and post selection. Uh, again, this is part of the experiments that we use to verify it. Another effect we call the quantum pigeonhole effect. Um, basically, this taught us that uh, there's a whole, we're kind of, when we were looking at EPR, we're kind of missing half the story. Right? There's some assumptions, rightfully so, that in order to create this kind of non-locality, the Alice and Bob's particles have to be, the non-locality have to be created together when they're at the source. Turns out this new uh, phenomenon we called quantum pinch hole doesn't have that kind of a restraint. So that taught us something completely new. Um, by the way, it was, this paper was voted as the number one paper in hard physics sciences by the National Academy of Sciences in 2017. I think that's the first time it ever happened for a foundation's paper. Quick slide about this, um, top-down causality. So this, it started with um, kind of a no-go theorem that Lucian Hardy put together a while back, mm -hmm. and basically said, because of this paradox, there's no way of having an ontological picture of, of reality. So I, I started to look at it um, using these weak measurements or weak values, and basically what we saw was a situation where these are two Mach Zander interferometers that overlap. If you look here, in this one we have an electron going in, and that one we have a positron going in. If you ask how many particles there are along this path, it turns out there's zero particles. There's no particle there. If you ask how many particles are going along this path, also zero particles there. If you ask about the interaction between these two paths, that is not zero. So the moral of the story is that um, this, this new structure of reality called weak values have a, a very strange behavior in that if you know the weak value of, this is the weak value of an individual particle number, the number of particles on this path and that path, right? That those are, there's no particle there, but it turns out even if the operators commute, the, the product rule is, is violated. So the weak value of the product of two operators is not equal to the individual operators. And so that turns out to be the key for a whole, really something completely different, completely new, and it allows us to show how you can have genuine, true, top-down causality contrary to what science told us we could never have. Okay, that's it.